qigong, neigong. What's the difference? What, why do we have these different terms that, that seem to, um, to talk about Chinese energy arts and practices, right? Um, are they different? Are they the same? Where is the overlap? What's going on with these terms? This is the, these, this is the question I want to look at in the following video and uh, get, to the, get to the bottom <laughs> of what's going on with these terms, um, at least from my perspective. I think probably the most important thing to remember um, when using these terms and when, you, when learning Chinese stuff and understanding uh, the culture is that uh, the way we use terms here in the West and in China is different. Not completely different, but there are some definite differences um, it's best to be aware of. And I find in the West, uh, we tend to like to categorize things very clearly. And um, even, you know, in our philosophical tradition, you know, we, classification is very important, right? Uh, I remember when I studied philosophy in, in university and, and uh, talked about, you know, as one kind of philosophy, I can't forget what it's called, but you know, their whole, their whole thing was just classification. You know, they'd sit around and, and you know, pick up a, a dinner fork and, and ask, is this a tool or is it a utensil? Uh huh. Right. <laughs> it's like okay, uh, you know, and and uh, maybe that's important. I think it is important to be, you know, it, it can be helpful to be have clarity with language and define our terms and whatnot. Um, but I find with Chinese stuff, it doesn't really help. I've I've found in my own um, my own practice, my own study of Chinese stuff, that we need to be more flexible with terms and realize that terms are going to shift depending on context. So I think uh, the, Ch the ancient Chinese, starting in the Warring States period, probably earlier, are very comfortable with um, relativity, right? Look at Zhuangzi, he's all about, you know, perspective and, 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 and understanding how th things only have meaning in relation to other things, right? There is no ultimate truth, um, or at least there is, there is an ultimate truth, but we can't get there through language. Language might help us kind of <laughs> figure out kind of how to go in the general direction, right? But it's not, ultimate truth cannot exist in language because language is limited based on perspective. And so, uh, coming back to our, our discussion here about Qigong versus Neigong, um, these, in other words, these terms, they are not clear, distinct categories of practice, right? They're not a specific thing. They are both sort of these broad umbrella terms that can house a wide variety of practices. And these two terms, they can overlap, right? It's not, um, it's not that Neigong is one thing and Qigong is another, at least from my understanding. Um, Qigong is a, a fairly modern term that was, came into use in the 1950s. Um, and it was a way of presenting traditional Chinese and um, energy arts and practices uh, in a modern context. And so uh, what a lot of the, the Qigong movement was a way of modernizing old, the old Chinese stuff, right? Chinese are like, well, how can this stuff's good? We know it has value. How can we kind of strip away stuff, um, kind of more superstitious stuff, and and you know the uh, make it more modern, more scientific, uh, and and that's how the Qigong movement was born. Um, and it was also seen as a as an alternative to a, a, um, a healthcare system. <laughs> it was cheap healthcare, right? If you know the idea was like if we can if we can teach peasants how to do qigong to care for the, their health, then uh, the state uh, does need to pay for it. You know, it's like win-win. Okay, let's do it. Sounds good. Um, uh, and so it's a, it's a fairly modern term and it really, it really got going in the 80s and 90s. Uh, and, and in those decades, you had something called the qigong fever. Uh, and there's a, there's a great book on it. You can, you can Google that, qigong fever. And um, it became very, very popular. Every, everyone was doing Qigong in, in China. And, uh, and then people from the West went to China. They learned a lot of the Qigong, brought it back to the West, started teaching it here. Um, um, however, 
that's just one way of, of, of looking at Chinese energy arts, right? Qigong is just one word that it works, people know what it is, makes sense. The interesting thing is when I started, and I started in the 90s, I started with a fairly traditional teacher uh, who never used the term. Qigong, like we, we never used that term to, we were doing energy arts. Uh, he would use the word in uh, nei gong, uh, or internals. Um, and uh, so what's the, what's the whole nei gong thing then, right? Well, my understanding is nei gong is just, it's an older term. Um, again, umbrella term. Um, there are systems of nei gong, right, that you can, you can learn. Um, my own teacher, Wang Liping, he, the, the official title of the practice that he teaches is nei gong, um, right? Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a big umbrella, right? And within it, we have these other systems. Now, it gets tricky because negong can also mean you can have negong, right? Have negong means you have internal skill, right? So someone, oh, he has, you know, gong fu, or he has negong, right? Or that guy, he has no negong, he has no internals, right? He, he doesn't have the internal skill. And so that's another way that negong gets used, you know? Uh, and so it really shifts depending on context. It's not like this concrete, distinct thing. Um, I practice Nei Gong, and, uh, and so I can talk to someone else who practices Nei Gong, and we, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll be practicing exactly the same thing. That's like saying, oh, I practice sports, and this guy practices sports, and so I go, you know, say, well, yeah, I practice sports, you know, you, sports where you put the the hockey puck on the ice and you have your your stick and you put on your skates and you you know you chase the puck down the the the, the rink and shoot into the net the other guy practiced sports no no that's not what you do at all are you crazy no sports is when you have a you know a little a little white ball and you put it on the grass and you have a club and you swing and you hit it and try to get in the hole you know someone else is like no that's not sports sports is you know you got a high bar and you jump up and you do some flips and you can see where i'm going right it, uh, it's just it kind of gets silly when you, when you start using Neigong and Qigong in those ways, right? It really depends on your lineage, uh, who your teacher was, and, and what system they're doing. And in ancient China, not, not even ancient China, I mean, even now still, uh, there's a lot of different terms for these practices that haven't really transitioned to, here to the West. Um, Daoyan's another great one. It gets used sometimes, I see it around sometimes, right? And that's been around since the Warring States period. Warring States, that's 2,500 years ago. They found, it, you know, the Daoyan um, illustrations in a tomb somewhere, right? Where you have people kind of doing stretches and whatnot. And that's 2,500 years ago. So Daoyan's definitely one. Yeah, um, Tunafa, the um, ingesting and expelling uh, method. There's so many, hundreds of years of development of energy and internal arts in China. So many different um, words for it and, and uh, um, ways of talking about it, right? And it gets, it's very complicated. Um, and so, yeah, so Qigong and Neigong are, are two ways, and they're the ways that are used, I think, the most in, in the West. I think Qigong is the most popular, but Neigong is getting more and more traction. Um, the other thing with Neigong, is, it's interesting, is to think of Neigong as a process. It's, it's, a, it's a way of training the body in, um, to achieve certain results, right? Um, it can be used that way as well. Um, yeah, so Qigong, Neigong, that's my understanding of, of how the two fit together. Uh, and oh, interesting, I just thought about this. Yoga, I think yoga is the same, you know? See, if you go to India, there's so many different kinds of yoga. And historically, you know, what we think of yoga in the West, you know, pretzel yoga, where you, you know, you do stretches and cross your leg, you know, go into all the, the slow stretching movements, which is great stuff. Um, that's kind of yoga for us, right? But, you know, that's, that's a certain kind of hatha yoga, which started at a certain historical point in India. And, and, and the word yoga, which means to, to yoke, to, to harness, um, you know, yoke, yoke a cow to help you plow the field, right? You get to harness to, to get results, all right? That word goes, you know, it's in the Upanishads, uh, the Vedas. Um, it's, it's, it's been used, it's been around. But what makes it to the West is, it's kind of weird. It's kind of like, it just becomes this much, much more, uh, much more, much narrower word that seems to relate to the same thing, right? Whereas it's, it's, 
it, my understanding in India, yoga is a, is a much broader umbrella un, under which hangs a lot of different stuff. Maybe that's a great way of looking at it as well, right? Um, and I think the same, th- same thing can be said of Tai Chi. There's a lot of different, different kinds of Tai Chi, but that's a topic for another day. I'll, I'll set that aside. So anyways, I uh, hope that uh, helps uh, lend clarity to, the, to uh, what, what the heck is Qigong and Neigong. And uh, if you've enjoyed this talk, um, feel free to make, leave comments below. I'd love to hear feedback. Again, this is just my own personal experience. I may be, you know, off my rocker here. I, you know, I, I'd love to hear about from other people what your experience and the, your understanding of those terms are. Um, and feel free to do that in the comments below. And I'll see you next time.